In January of 1850, the United States of America contained 30 states. 15 of these were considered northern states and 15 southern. The North, due to its larger population, had a greater number of congressmen in the House of Representatives. But in the Senate, the power between North and South was perfectly balanced. Until California applied for admission to the Union as a free state. For the first time, we are about permanently to destroy the balance of power between the sections. Northerners could have their way in the House of Representatives. So it was crucial to Southerners, they believed, to protect the South from this rampant abolition that they feared was sweeping the North to maintain a balance of power in the Senate. The country was at odds over slavery, and the traditional spirit of compromise and cooperation had broken down. Sectional hostility was not new in 1850, but it did reach a kind of crisis. And the crisis followed hard on the heels of the Mexican War. From 1846 to 1848, the United States was at war with Mexico, and the victory produced enormous Western lands, new territories that fed into the American nation. Many Northerners backed uh, the imposition of the Wilmot Proviso uh, on that territory. Uh, this would have uh, blocked slavery from entering it by congressional statutes. By the end of 1849, a number of Southerners um, and Southern states were threatening to secede should Congress ever pass the Wilmot Proviso. Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky believed the crisis could be solved. Clay got up and gave this speech about the five bleeding wounds. He said, here are five wounds that need to be solved, not just the one of admitting California. He said, I want to organize territories where territorial governments need to be organized, too. We need to settle the Texas-New Mexico boundary dispute. Uh, we need to do something about the slave auctions in the District of Columbia, and we need to do something about fugitive slaves. Clay was known as the Great Compromiser. He was the author of the Missouri Compromise, which had settled the boundaries of slavery 30 years earlier. In 1850, he once again lived up to his name. Mr. President, I hold in my hand a series of resolutions which I desire to submit to the consideration of this body. Taken together in combination, they propose an amicable arrangement of all questions in controversy between the free and the slave states, growing out of the subject of slavery. Clay's compromise catalyzed the Senate and provoked what is known as the Great Debate. For months, the galleries of the Senate were filled with spectators as senators spoke eloquently for or against the bill. I speak today for the preservation of the Union. Hear me for my cause. California will become the test question. If you admit her under all the difficulties that oppose her admission, you compel us to infer that you intend to exclude us from the whole of the acquired territories with the intention of destroying irretrievably the equilibrium between the two sections. Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and John C. Calhoun, the Senate's most distinguished leaders, were aged and infirm. This was the last time that the three men, known as the Great Triumvirate, would meet on the political battlefield. Despite tremendous effort, the Senate was unable to agree on all the points in Clay's proposal, and the bill collapsed. It was Stephen Douglas, the senator from Illinois, who pieced it back together again. We have heard so much talk about the North and the South as if those two sections were the only ones necessary to be taken into consideration. When there is a power in this nation greater than either the North or the South, that power is the country known as the Great West. The genius of Stephen Douglas was to 
break up the compromise into individual parts and put together bare majorities, Southerners or Northerners with the group of compromisers that would achieve a majority and put together a plan in which most Northerners and most Southerners had not compromised at all, but had found a way through these five major principles uh, to create a solution, hopefully permanent, to the issues that had grown out of the Mexican War. The Compromise of 1850 was a political solution to a problem that lay deep within American society. For a while, it seemed to work. California came in as a free state, but rather than siding with the North, it became a democratic state, and Democrats tended to take Southern positions on sectional measures. New Mexico territories were organized without any prohibition on slavery. Slave auctions were stopped in Washington, D.C., but the private sale of slaves went on. The Texas-New Mexico boundary was settled at its current location. But there was a kind of euphoria that a crisis had been passed. Uh, and by 1852, both the Whig and Democratic parties were committing themselves, in effect, to the finality uh, of this issue and, and never to allow any debate about slavery to emerge again. What congressional leaders did not realize was that the Compromise of 1850 contained a poison pill. Southerners were convinced that they had gained very little. The only thing of substance they had gained, they, they felt, was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, in which the provisions for the return of fugitive slaves, which was written into the Constitution itself, was strengthened substantially. That meant that the real test in white Southerners' eyes of the Northern willingness to abide by the Compromise of 1850 could be judged by their willingness to abide by the Fugitive Slave Act. But the Fugitive Slave Act would soon fan the flames of abolitionism in the North. The peace between North and South would prove to be short-lived, and the Great Compromise no more than a postponement of hostilities. But that postponement may have been critical. Some historians have argued, and I think this is true, that this averted civil war uh, it allowed uh, the North to grow that much stronger over the subsequent decade uh, to the position. It might have lost the war if there had been a civil war in 1850 uh, that it was able to win in the 1860s because of that decade's delay. <laughs> 